Welcome to a Practice Pro CPD, brought to you by Law Pro. So, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Judah Strachinski, the director of Practice Pro, Law Pro's claims prevention and risk management program. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Toronto, which is also where the offices of Law Pro and, of course, the Toronto Lawyers Association are located. I respectfully acknowledge that Toronto is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, uh, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It's now also home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. As this meeting's virtual, we're not all gathered in Toronto. Some of you uh, might be on other traditional territories. And if so, we invite you to take time to learn about and acknowledge the traditional territory and treaty lands you're on. Uh, as a resource, please visit native-lands.ca uh, where you can search by location to find the appropriate territorial acknowledgement for your region. Uh, you can also use the resources tabs uh, to learn more uh, and uh, you can always contact a Friendship Centre for further guidance. I'd like to recognize the long history of all First Nations in Ontario and the Métis and Inuit peoples. We thank First Nations people who live uh, on these lands and for sharing them with us in peace. Thank you for joining us this morning, uh, this lovely summer day, uh, for this Law Pro CPD event, uh, Tips for Tips for Wills and Estates Lawyers is presented, of course, as always, in partnership with the Toronto Lawyers Association. Today, the event is divided into four parts. So first, uh, as usual, we're going to review the top areas where Wills and Estates Lawyers have reported claims, and we're going to share some tips to avoid some of those most common issues. Second, we're going to review a few of the risks that have been exacerbated by the shift to hybrid and online practice uh, through the pandemic. Uh, we're going to focus really on assessing for capacity and undue influence, uh, given our hybrid, remote, and other environments. Third, we're going to describe some of the frauds that are targeting lawyers, including wills and estates lawyers. And finally, we'll talk about some tips uh, for practice management to get you to your next normal as we return to uh, some sort of post-pandemic life. Uh, we'll explore the people processes and tech tips that can help you adapt and continuously grow your practice uh, and thrive even in changing times. So uh, we've put together some resources for today's program. They're already in the chat for those of you who are in the program with us live. Uh, if you're coming by replay, if you go to practicepro.ca slash CPD and just click on today's event, you'll be able to download the materials directly from there. The speakers we have uh, today, they're amazing, knowledgeable experts. I'm going to let them all introduce themselves when they first uh, say good morning to you, uh, but you can learn more about each of them in the program resources. We've included their bio, their biographies as well. So let's get started with the risks 101, uh, the biggest claims risks that wills and estates lawyers face. Uh, I'm going to start by just sharing my screen. Uh, for those of you who are New to Law Pro, you may not have seen these sorts of slides before, but for many, these that I lovingly call the wheels of misfortune uh, kind of guide our assessment of uh, where the key risks are. You'll see this, uh, this wheel here, which has been updated to the latest data we have, which goes to the end of last year. Uh, in your materials, you're also going to find a wills tip sheet that is going to have a similar wheel, but it's slightly older. So there are going to be some slight changes to the percentages, but the themes remain the same. And so I'm going to invite my excellent colleague, Chris Stankowitz, to take us through uh, the types of losses, the types of claims reported. Uh, Chris is right there on the ground level. He's a claims counsel. He sees these issues every day. He sees the reports come in and he has particular expertise in family, wills, estates, uh, and so really well situated to give us that uh, eye on the ground uh, sort of report. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Judah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so what I'd like to go over today are just some of the main areas where we see claims in the wills and estates area, and then review some of the strategies that we can uh, employ to minimize the risks of uh, claims being made. So if we look at uh, the claims that we see in Law Pro in wills and estates, Judah, if we could just uh, maybe go over to that uh, slide, um, you'll see that uh, inadequate investigation is the main uh, the 
largest grouping uh, cluster of, of, of claims that we see, followed by communications uh, in second, error of law uh, in third. So let's take a zoom in and take a look, a closer look at what these mean. So what do we mean by inadequate investigation? At a fundamental level, it means uh, you know, not asking enough questions, not digging deep enough into the client circumstances when developing their estate plan. For example, um, asking questions, uh, not asking questions about assets, uh, what kind of assets they are, uh, how they are held, their ownership, uh, and of course, sometimes verifying those facts yourself. A client may not have a correct understanding of how they uh hold a certain kind of asset, whether they, for example, if it's real property, whether they own it uh, jointly with someone else, whether it's there, if it is owned jointly, whether it's in joint tenancy uh, or tenancy in common, um, perhaps they own shares in a corporation, uh, but maybe they own, uh, you know, shares in another corporation that holds shares in the in the second corporation. All those sorts of facts uh, are important to uh, establish and to ask the right questions and sometimes verify uh, yourself because, of course, without that, um, without establishing those sorts of facts, you you know, you may not be flagging certain important issues for the client, and it's going to uh, having that information uh, is going to influence the kind of estate plan uh, that you develop for the client. Other common issues that, that we see in these uh, inadequate investigation claims are, uh, for example, um, are there beneficiary designations on assets, right? So that the assets will pass outside of the estate. Um, you know, depending on how things are structured, uh, there may not be, uh, and, and if you don't have that information, that there are beneficiary designations on investments or a pension uh, or an account, uh, you know, and those assets pass outside of the estate, there may not be sufficient assets in the estate to satisfy the bequests. And, you know, it may frustrate the estate plan uh, in some way if, if you don't have that information uh, up front. Are there prior wills? This is, of course, uh, you know, a very important uh, thing, uh, issue to probe. Um, uh, if there are prior wills, what are the changes that the client is making uh, now? And importantly, why are they making those changes, right? And it's important to, uh, to query why those changes are being made to sort of understand the reasons why something is being done this way. There may be other ways of, uh, of doing it, or you know, even if it's just to know the reasons, it's important that you document that in your file, because of course, if there are significant changes uh, being made in wills, you know, that could lead, there could be litigation down the road at some point, and it's important that your file reflects why the reasons of uh, why those changes are being made. Um, uh, what about past relationships? Are there uh, are there dependents um, uh, that that need to be taken into account? Is there a former spouse? Are there children? Is this a blended family? Uh, and you know, are is the client going to want to treat children from a past relationship different than children in the current relationship? All those sorts of issues like need to be teased out, right? The family dynamics and um, you know, and if there are support obligations, of course, those need to be taken into account uh, when uh, preparing a will, when developing that estate plan. Capacity and undue influence. Now, of course, you know, the most common way that a will drafting lawyer gets uh, dragged into some kind of estate litigation is when there's a will challenge. Uh, and of course, as, as you know, that the, the most common allegations made in will challenges are that the testator lacked uh, capacity, testamentary capacity, or was subject to some kind of undue influence. So with that in mind, you really you know, want to explore those issues um, uh, quite thoroughly and to document having done so. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the client is going to understands, uh, understands what kind of assets they hold, um, the nature and sort of the, the quantum of, of what they own. Uh, you want to ask all sorts of uh, questions just to satisfy yourself with capacity. And of course, where there are some concerns about capacity, it may be appropriate to uh, have, an, uh, have a capacity assessment prepared. 
Um, of course, even when you do have that capacity assessment, you still need to probe the issue yourself because you know capacity can shift over time. Um, so you, you want to make sure you satisfy yourself that when you're receiving instructions or when the will is being signed, uh, that the client has capacity undue influence again uh, important to probe those issues whether there anyone is exerting uh, some kind of you know uh, overt uh, influence on this person pushing this estate plan uh, it's important to make those inquiries uh, and and having done so will you know will put you in a good position if, if you are uh, ever drawn into some kind of litigation and have to produce your file or give evidence in, in those situations. So um, important to probe those issues. Uh, communications claims, so what does that refer to? Some, it, it's some breakdown uh, between, uh, in the communications between the lawyer and the client. Uh, sometimes that takes the form of, you know, uh, the lawyer receives uh, certain instructions, but the will that's actually drafted doesn't reflect those instructions, right? Those things happen, uh, and it's just important to, you know, compare your notes I, uh, when the will is actually prepared to see that they, they reflect, the, the will that's prepared reflects the instructions that you received. Um, uh, is there a language barrier, right? Sometimes do, do you need an do you need an interpreter to explain the will uh, to the person, or you know, is the first allegation that's going to be made after they pass away that they uh, didn't understand what they were signing? You know, they uh, they had language difficulties, so that's another issue to be uh, th that we see and that uh, we need to be careful about. Um, was the client not advised of the options available to them, right? Uh, for example, uh, you know, if they have corporate assets, w was a dual will strategy appropriate? And then later, you know, uh, is there some loss to the estate because one wasn't employed? So that would be another failure of, uh, of communication, advising the client that this is one option uh, of doing uh, of doing things. Um, were they advised about, you know, how estate, how joint assets may pass outside of the estate, uh, about estate administration tax, uh, potentially capital gains taxes? On property, uh, so all those things, uh, you know, important that it's important that uh, be discussed with the client uh, uh, thoroughly, so that there's no, uh, you know, there's no allegation, uh, there's no foundation later for an allegation that the client didn't understand this and it should have been discussed with them. Um, error of law is uh, third place there. I mean, that's a fairly self-explanatory one, but as you know, uh, estates law. Uh, really intersects with many different areas of law uh, so it's just you know it's important to be mindful of situations where we need expert uh, assistance advice from perhaps accountants uh, financial tax experts sometimes corporate uh, issues uh, sometimes family law issues right uh, so we just need to be mindful of you know de depending on the complexity of the estate do we need uh, input from uh, from another expert uh, when developing the estate plan now, so what are some of the strategies that we can uh, we can employ to minimize the risk of, of a claim being made? Well, first of all, uh, dig deeper and ask probing questions. Uh, get documents to verify the information that you're receiving. Uh, do that work upfront to to verify to make sure you have all the information that you need to advise the client properly, and that the information that you're getting uh, is correct. And second. Document, document, document. Uh, you know, take uh, good notes, take extensive notes, memos to file, reporting letters. All of those things will help you uh, assist the client and make sure that you're, you know, flagging all the right issues, discussing the correct things, and it will help you uh, if there's ever if you're ever faced with a claim. And of course. Uh, uh, you know, the it will help us defend you in those situations if there is a claim, because uh, you know there's a lot more that can be done with a well-documented file than a, a file that's sparsely documented. Uh, so, document. If there's two things, if there's two takeaways from from the session, it's uh, ask probing questions, uh, dig deeper, and document uh, your file. Um, 
Other issues, you know, comparing your draft to the notes that you receive to make sure that they, uh, the final product actually reflects the instructions. Um, confirm and report important decisions uh, and instructions with the client. Reporting letters, uh, you know, are great in these uh, in these situations. But of course, you know, an email to the client confirming why they're doing something uh, is is good too. Um, seek input from experts where appropriate uh, i was alluding to earlier when we're dealing with issues that you know we may not specialize in that we need help in um tax corporate issues uh you know use experts they can uh they can be critical and we can really avoid you know a, a significant problem down the road um, know when the risk is too high right if there's a lot of uh, red flags coming up sometimes the best way of avoiding a claim is just sidestepping the retainer altogether. So, you know, be mindful of that, right? That sometimes this may not, if there's enough uh, red flags present, it may not be a retainer that you want to accept. Um, know who your client is and who you're taking instructions from, right? It's not uncommon for sometimes a, a relative uh, of the client to make the first uh, contact with your office, uh, but you need to make sure that the person you're getting instructions from at the end of the day is that client and not the relative that's contacting your office and that that you know client is nowhere and that relative is nowhere in the near uh, in the room when you're discussing these things uh, with the client and uh, signing uh, signing the wills. Um, what if the client passes away or they're incapacitated and somebody asks your, is making inquiries with your office about uh, a copy of the will or the powers of attorney? Of course, if it's the uh, named estate trustee, they're going to be entitled to a copy of the will. Of course, and if it's the attorney for property or personal care and, and the client's incapacitated, they're going to be entitled to a copy of the attorney, uh, of the power of attorney. If it's somebody else uh, that's, you know, not, it doesn't have that authority, they're not going to be able to, you know, you shouldn't produce those documents to them. And probably, um, you know, you're not going to be able to give them much useful information because uh, uh, solicitor client privilege, duty of confidentiality, all those things are, uh, are still duties that you have to uh, protect um so and of course if anybody is requesting copies of your file your notes uh report it to law pro right away uh there's no financial impact in submitting a claim notice report it does not cost you anything and it you know really when we get involved up front there's a lot we can do to uh, minimize the risk of a claim being made against you or if there is an issue to try to resolve that issue um, and you know it avoids any sort of late reporting coverage issues uh, if the matter is not reported early so re report early if you're faced with uh, with those situations thanks chris you know that that's a whirlwind so you know i really appreciate the the insights and just so everyone remembers, you know, Chris's speech and, and you know, this overview, which he can do uh, in his sleep after seeing hundreds of these cases, uh, you know, Chris is a real expert and you can watch him again when we post this uh, on, on YouTube, uh, but you also have the written materials uh, in uh, the uh, resources as well. And so some of those tips that Chris has highlighted are in, uh, in a, a very short, you know, two page or claims uh, document that reviews these key areas of risk. There's also a full article about when to report to LawPro when somebody comes calling about a will, uh, starts asking about a file. It's human nature uh, for you to want to help. It's human nature when you get a call from a relative who perhaps you've also met, perhaps that relative was in the room for part of your discussions. It's human nature for you to want to share information. You want to help, you chose a helping profession. The problem is that things can go south very quickly on those sorts of cases. And we've seen it where a lawyer, even just in, in taking the call and saying, yeah, I've got a copy of the will, that might not be permitted either, depending on uh, what your client had intended for how that will was to be made available eventually. And so, you know, there are certain issues uh, that you need to just be very cautious around. And that call from any outsider about a will, if they do not have authority, as Chris pointed out, is, is a really dangerous place. But there's an article about that issue as well in the resources. 
So interesting to watch the uh, the Q and A coming in. We've got a, a question that uh, we've heard uh, from time to time uh, when uh, uh, when that call comes in, uh, and let's say that the presence of the will itself is confidential. Uh, what's the best way to respond to that? And and you know, to me, one of the easiest ways is I'm sorry, I I, I just can't speak to any of these uh, inquiries. I have no ability to do so. Uh, Chris, over to you first, wondering if there's anything particular you advise when when we get these sorts of inquiries from time to time. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that covers it, Judah. And, uh, you know, it, really, it's it's uh, it's difficult sometimes and awkward to be unhelpful. Uh, but, you know, the, those duties of confidentiality and privilege are are. Uh, so fundamental uh, in our profession that uh, you know unfortunately if it's not someone that that has authority uh, to stand in the place of, of the client as their estate trustee or their uh, attorney for property there, there really is you know not much at all <laughs> you could often give in uh, in the way of um, uh, in the way of information and of course if you are concerned about if you have any reason for concern there, you can report it to us and, and, and we can assist you with, with dealing with that as well. And of course, if there are any ethical uh, issues that come up uh, about how to respond or you have concerns about, about what the rules of professional conduct may or may not cover, you can always call the Law Society's Practice Management Hotline and they'll guide you through those sorts of areas on the risk pieces around a potential claim. We have our own uh, guides about calling us uh, for for help uh, just to navigate through, but with both of those powers combined, uh, you uh, you have supports and uh, and can practice with confidence in that area. Another couple of questions have popped up about uh, about the retainer. So let me start with uh, basics around the retainer because one of the questions was what should be included in a will's retainer, and uh, another question related to it was can we use a limited scope retainer? So let me start with retainers generally. Retainers should be uh, clear and outline the scope of the services that you're going to be providing. And some areas of law, you can piece out discrete tasks that you're going to be doing. And some areas of law, it's more likely that you're going to do most, if not all of a particular legal service assignment. So for example, if you're a real estate lawyer doing a residential real estate transaction, chances are you're doing that entirety of that piece. You're not going to be do limiting it and saying, I'm not going to be searching title for you, or I'm not going to be asking whether or not you need or want title insurance. There are certain must-haves in a retainer. And wills and estates is one of those areas where pretty much if you are doing a will, you can't just contract out of the, the bulk of the assignment of preparing that will. And so we'll, we'll get into what that means in practice, but the starting point for if you don't have, uh, if, you, if, you, if you do not have a template retainer, we have templates at practicepro.ca. So you can use those as a starting point uh, and then fill in what you are being retained to do. So in a typical retainer, if you're doing both wills and powers of attorney, you should say that you have been retained to do the will and the powers of attorney, and you should spell out which powers of attorney, because not all people are necessarily going to want both your power of attorney for property and your power of attorney for personal care, for example. So you want to spell it out. But these retainers should not be the, uh, as Ann Vespery, a lawyer out of Ottawa, once describes these to me, uh, where the power of attorney is simply a, do you want fries with that? Right, each and every step of your retainer is going to require all of that investigation that Chris pointed out to you in our in our wheel. The power of attorney requires lots of questions, regardless of which one you're doing. So you're going to want to make sure you understand your scope. And if you talked about potentially doing your power of attorney, you talked about other pieces in your retainer, you should exclude what you talked about doing, but the client has instructed you to not do. So you might want to say, for example, Chris, thank you, you've come in. We discussed wills and powers of attorney. I offer to provide you with a will, power of attorney for personal care, power of attorney for property. I have been retained to provide your will. I have been expressly told to not prepare any powers of attorney for you. Uh, it's my understanding that you already have some. It's my understanding that you were worried about costs. It's my understanding, it doesn't matter. 
You can put it in or not, why the why, but you can put right into the retainer, I am not doing this. You might even say, because you do not have powers of attorney for care, I highly recommend it you got one, but you have declined to obtain those today. So that's sort of a retainer 101 in terms of the scope of your retainer. And then you can talk about fees and all the rest of it. And our template retainers are a good starting point for that. But let's talk about limited scope retainer because there are occasions where certain pieces would be excluded. And it's probably best to put that in the retainer. So Rebecca, why don't I start with you? Thanks. So there have been a number of follow-up questions in the chat about this. So I think sort of my answer is gonna be a bit unpopular based on the tone of the questions in the chat, which is that in most cases, I think, no, you cannot have a limited scope retainer for drafting a will. Can, there are certain, as Judah said, things you can carve out. If there is a really complex tax thing and you are advising, you need a tax lawyer, your accountant has to be involved, and they are saying, no, I don't care what taxes are owing as a result of this plan. I just want to do what I want to do. I think that you can probably say, you can say, I have advised that there are significant tax implications arising from your plan. You have to know enough to be able to at least issue spot the tax issues. Um, I've advised that there are significant tax issues arising out of your plan. I've advised that you contact a tax lawyer. I've provided the name of a tax lawyer. I've advised, advised that we include your accountant. You have declined to do so. You have advised me that any income tax owing as a result of this plan is not of concern to you. Like I would say all of that, both in my retainer letter and my reporting letter. And then I think you might be okay on the limiting the scope around the tax. Can you limit the scope around asset disclosure? I really don't believe that you can. I really don't. I do not do not think that you can draft a will for somebody without knowing their full assets. And I, as with all of you, and I can certainly see in the q and I get pushback on that. I know you all get pushback on that. You have to take a firm line on it. Like when I get pushback saying my, you know, I've done lots of will, I had this last week. I've done lots of wills over the course of my life. I'm 77 years old. No lawyer has ever made me do this before. There's no reason that I have to do this. And what I really kindly say is, I'm sorry that this is a new requirement for you. Every lawyer who has ever done your will should have asked you to do this. And I can't open a file without it. Like it's a non-starter for me. And if you lose the file, you lose the file. And hopefully you're getting the file back because when they call somebody else, that person is also meeting their professional obligations by saying, I can't open a file without this. Um, and I, there's a bunch of questions in the chat about how do you do this and maintain a reasonable cost for a will. I think that that ship has sailed a little bit. I think that there is no longer a place for, I'm closing the deal on your real estate and I'll throw in a will for $500. I do not think that you can meet your professional obligations at this point. I mean, unless you're willing to do it pro bono, basically, I don't think you can meet the obligations that you have on you what the standard of care is that has been set in terms of asset disclosure and the questions you have to ask and the number of times you want to go circle back to clients to review the instructions and reconfirm them, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But I, I don't think you can do that in a $500 will. So I appreciate completely the questions that have been asked saying like, this is just not possible. Like I can't do this and earn a living on doing wills. And the answer is you have to charge more because the price is negotiable. Like you can change what you're costing on, what you're charging on a will, but your obligations in terms of asking the questions, doing the review and getting the asset disclosure are not negotiable, from my opinion. Yeah, Sorry. it does the, uh, no, <laughs> that's, I, I, look, I, I think this is absolutely correct. Uh, as lawyers, we have to ask, what value are we bringing to the client? And sometimes a client doesn't want to pay for the value or doesn't see eye to eye with you about what the value is. But the value of having a lawyer do a will is that we see the whole sight line and then we advise and draft. If somebody wants a quick will where no one's going to advise them 
and they don't want to disclose what their assets are, and they want to take a flyer, even though a poorly drafted will could end horrifically for them, there are online sites that can do that for you know, money that is nowhere near what a lawyer would charge with good reason. They are not providing the judgment that lawyers provide. You are there providing judgment. You are there with your expertise in wills and estates. That's what people are paying for if they are not willing to pay for it, if they are not willing to give you the information for you to use your expertise and, ju- and to exercise your judgment, then there's a problem from the outset on the retainer. Pia, uh, you've seen these go south. Uh, any thoughts uh, before we move to another topic? Yeah, my um, so my perspective is, is as a litigator. And so I deal with these when they go sideways. And so I 100% agree with everything all three of you have said. You know, there are no shortcuts. And I, my note literally was what Rebecca said, charge more, <laughs> you know, if you're going to do this practice area. Unfortunately, it's a reality, um, you know, and as far as investigations, I think even things that used to be considered sort of best practice, but not necessary are becoming more and more necessary. So something, for example, I've seen recently is um, a testator will think that title to their house is held one way, like just joint tenancy, and then it's actually tenants in common. And, it, you know, it actually really does thwart their whole estate plan. Um, and you have two sets of beneficiaries that are now upset and you have, it ends up on my plate, you know, costing tens of thousands of dollars to litigate when a simple $15 title search by the lawyer would have solved that problem. Um, same with separation agreements, not checking to make sure that there's obligations for insurance or something else under a separation agreement. If your client's been divorced and, you know, Sometimes people will say, well, I don't know where my separation agreement is. It's like, well, you'll probably remember the name of your family lawyer because <laughs> so, you know, let me speak for them, get me a direction and I'll, I'll, I'll get it from them directly because, you know, people don't want to go through their files. It's intrusive. It's an intrusive process and it can be really awkward as the lawyer, but you, you know, it, it's, it's the, the risk reward. It, it's sort of really something that you have to think about constantly if you're going to practice in this area. Um, and if a will is challenged, you can end up in court. There's, on you know, the, the fee that you get paid to sit in court is nowhere near what you'd be paid if you're working. Um, the stress of that, you know, having to report yourself to law pro, all of that is just um, something to consider when you're when you're practicing in this area that, you know, maybe it is worth charging a bit more and you can justify it. Like Judah said, you know, you're bringing expertise to the table. You know, we, we have this discussion from time to time, and obviously it's up to you to decide what you would like to charge as a fee and what the market will sustain. But, you know, if you charge 20% more, then you need 20% fewer clients to make the same amount of money. And so sometimes, you know, it, it, there's a catch and release to this. Uh, you want your clients to be aligned with how you wish to practice, not the other way around. That drive to the bottom in terms of what we would be providing, it means that we are not providing our skill and judgment. And so you really want to be careful around this. And that's why uh, I've put the retainer letter uh, models into the chat. But one of the other resources we have is a standard non-engagement letter, because people will come to your office. And one of the skills that lawyers need to be comfortable doing is saying no, saying this is not right for how I practice. I'm not going to deal with a complex matter this way. I mean, one of the questions that just came in is, what do I do if somebody has assets internationally, but they only want me to consider their Canadian assets? No, unacceptable. Somebody may want to hide assets. We have no idea what the potential implications are. It may be that international tax advice may be required, and you may need to explain that to a client and say that we need to line up our ducks in a complex estate plan and will for you. But if you know that somebody has assets and they're telling you they have the assets, but you're not to consider the assets, that's a red flag, right? And so we always want to make sure that we feel comfortable. And the only way to feel comfortable is if you get the documents. You know, this sends me like, in sort of a PTSD way back to when I was a litigator and I had a client who said, you know, I lost money on my investments and I wanna sue. And I remember saying, okay, that's great. Can I see the financial, you know, all of your shareholder like records and all that, why don't you trust me? You're supposed to be my mouthpiece. Why don't you trust me? I wanna sue these people. I lost money. Okay, well, the market took a downturn for a while there. Can I see your statements, right? 
there's a real risk if I, if I go ahead, full steam ahead, and I haven't seen their statements before I'm issuing a claim and getting them all the way through to discovery and all the rest of it. To be a good litigator, I'd need to see the documents. To be a good wills lawyer, I need to see the documents. And if that client's not giving me the documents, it's a recipe for disaster in any of those circumstances. So, you know, lots of due diligence that needs to go into here. And that's why inadequate investigation is the number one issue in wills and estates. Go back to those pie charts. Normally, inadequate investigation makes the top three, no doubt, across all complaint areas. But in wills, it's the number one area. And just to put the cherry on top here of this, uh, this experience, they're going up. We're seeing inadequate investigation claims going up. So the best thing you can do for yourself is get the documents, spend the time with your clients, dig deeper and explain the process with your clients so they understand the why behind it. Just that you're doing this for them, to help them. And that's what your expertise requires. So it's been a really good uh, discussion. I see our, our Q&A is blowing up right now. So clearly we've struck a chord, uh, pinched a nerve perhaps. I will look at this, uh, these questions, but for now we're gonna move on because there's, there are other areas of risk that have come up. And one of those, er the, those areas have to do with the shift to remote. You'll see that in the materials, we have lots there uh, around best practices and how to avoid issues arising on uh, the in, in the online world where we can now uh, you know sign documents electronically. Uh, this is a huge shift uh, prior to a pandemic. I think it was an unthinkable shift, uh, but we are here and there's no turning back. And so there are some new things that have risen and uh, some of you are going to be moving into fully online wills and estates practices. Some of you will be meeting clients face to face but there are two big issues that arise. One is capacity and one is undue influence. So let's start with capacity. Uh, and Rebecca, why don't you start us off there? Okay, thanks, Judah. Yes, the Q&A is blowing up. There were a couple of follow-ups on what I said about if someone says they won't disclose the assets, am I saying don't take the retainer? And the answer is yes, I am saying if they won't disclose your asset, their assets, don't take the retainer. Um, just to clarify what I said. Yes, I was taking a pretty hard line on that. Um, okay, so capacity. Yes, there's sort of, you know, capacity can be trickier when we're assessing it online, but capacity has always been a tricky one. And particularly in this practice area um, where lots of times we're dealing with older clients um, or we know that, you know, if you're doing a corporate deal, it's not gonna fall apart because someone's assessing capacity, right? Like that's not going to be what tanks a corporate deal. That is going to be in lots of cases what someone brings a challenge against a will for. So you really want your notes and you want to practice in a really self-protective way when it comes to capacity. Um, so first of all, you know, when Jude asked me to talk about capacity this morning, uh, no joke, I went back to my law school summary <laughs> notes on capacity from 17 years ago, because I think actually the base principles of capacity, first of all, the test hasn't changed, the rules haven't changed, the Banks and Goodfellow test from 1870 is still the test. Um, and that stuff matters, right? You have to actually keep top of mind what actually are we talking about when we're talking about capacity? Okay, so obviously the legal age is 18, unless you may remember from law school, those things about if the person's on a ship or if they're in the military, then you can do it if they're under 18. But basically the legal age is 18. And that comes up for me more often than I would think, um, typically in terms of people, not so much with wills, but with parents of children with disabilities who are worried that when their children turn 18, they lose the right to make decisions for them. And they want to have the powers of attorney in place before that happens. And my answer to that is always come back to me when your kid turns 18. Come back to me the week your kid turns 18, ideally. Um, and then we're into a capacity conversation about whether that child with a disability has capacity to grant a power of attorney. Typically, it's not about a will. Um, it's about whether parents can continue to advocate for their kids you know, adequately without requiring a guardianship appointment. So 18, 
you know, you got to stick to that. Um, knowledge and approval and mental capacity are the other two components of it. I know we all know this, but the refresher is always helpful. The one thing to remember about, lots of things to remember about capacity is that the law presumes capacity. We are operating from an assumption that the person has capacity, right? And we also have, as Judah said, we have a natural inc inclination to help clients and we also have a legal obligation to help clients, right? It's not enough to say like, I met with someone for an hour and then write them a letter saying, I'm not totally sure. I don't feel comfortable doing this. Goodbye right? We can't actually abandon a client once we have started talking to them about this. So you want to keep in your mind what the capacity test is. They have to understand the nature and act of making a will and the effect of the will. They have to understand the nature and extent of the property of which they are disposing. They have to comprehend the consequences of any gift in the will, and they have to not have insane delusions or general insanity, which in 2022 are fabulous terms. But the asset form that we were talking about, when you want clients to disclose their assets, first of all, you have to have them disclose their assets to have a complete file. Second of all, it's a great way to assess capacity, right? Because typically clients are submitting that asset form ahead of time. And to be honest, where are clients in their 30s, I'm running through with them to ask them about any questions I have about it, but am I drilling down? Like, did you fill this out yourself? Do you know the names of these accounts? No. When a client's in their 70s or 80s, no matter what, when I get that asset form, I'm assuming, rightly or wrongly, I am operating from a position that they did not complete it themselves. And I'm asking them to confirm to me in person or on Zoom. Uh, I don't really do stuff over the telephone. To me, I can't properly do a capacity assessment over the phone or satisfy myself. But over Zoom or in person, I am having them confirm to me what they know of their assets. Do I need them to know? I, I had a client yesterday who's 83 who started listing to me on Zoom each one of her account numbers, looking straight at me. And I was like, do you know all of your account numbers off by heart? She said, yes, I do. And I was like, great. I'm in my mid forties and I certainly do not, but power to you. Do I want them to do that? Absolutely not. Do I want them to have a sense? I have some accounts at TD. I have some accounts at BMO. My son's really managing them. But I know basically this is what I have. Absolutely. I want them to at least have a sense of this quantum. Like they don't need to know it to the hundred or whatever, but they need to know, do they have $80,000 or do they have $800,000? I want in my notes that they know that. Um, so the asset form, in addition to being part of the file, really helps you, I think, with an assessment of capacity. Um, so as I said, the law assumes capacity, we operate from a presumption of capacity, but as soon as capacity is challenged, that presumption is spent, and then we have to prove it. And we is really the lawyer, right? Like it is the person asserting capacity, the executor, whomever is on that sort of receiving end of the application claiming that there's no capacity, but really it's coming to us. And you better have done some kind of sufficient assessment. So there's limits to what we can do, obviously. We're not certified capacity assessors. And it is, to my mind, not reasonable to send every client for a capacity assessment. I just don't think that's fair, right? Like if there are circumstances, if I can see, you know, they're cutting out a kid or like, you know, if it's spicy, like if I can see that this is landing on Pia's desk, and I'm not confident in my own ability to do a formal capacity assessment, I want one in the file, fine. But that's a burden, right? Like it's a financial burden and it's an emotional burden to put on a client to say you have to have a capacity assessment. And I don't think it's necessarily always fair to do it just to protect ourselves. Um, I think there's a lot you can do in your notes. So I remember about, I don't know, 10 years ago, I was at a talk that Karina Weigel gave and she said where clients are elderly, she is noting every single thing about the scope of the meeting. How did they get to, or I don't know if she talked about how they get to her office. I know always if they've come to my office, how did they get here? Did someone pick them up and bring them? Did they drive themselves? Did they park in my parking lot? Did they find their way through the maze from my parking lot into my office? It's in my notes. It takes me 10 seconds to put that in my notes. Did they take the TTC on their own? That's in my notes. Like that to me 
is pretty instructive of their ability to function in the world. Karina talked about, you know, she notes like, is the person well-dressed, well put together, made up? Listen, if I was assessing capacity based on knowing how to put on makeup, I've literally never had capacity a day in my life, but I can see that that is something that you would want in your notes. Like I, my notes are pretty, you know, where I think it's questionable. My notes are noting all of these things. What did we talk about? Is the election coming up? Did they rate, you know, those kinds of things. If the small talk that goes into those meetings about, did you vote? What were the lineups like? What did you think of the speeches? All of that is in my notes. Like to me, all of that is instructive about capacity. Pia may disagree whether that's a defense to capacity, but I just think it bolsters the file. Everything they know about what's happening in the world, to me, bolsters the file. Um, and the thing is, you know, they don't obviously need to know all that in order to make a will. They need to have knowledge and approval of their assets and of the decisions that they're making. And the flip side is true. Yeah, so they can have early onset, onset Alzheimer's and not know anything about the world and not understand where they are and not remember who I am from time to time that we meet. And they can still have capacity to do a will, right? So in those cases where there is, to me, really questionable capacity, I meet with people several times. And I don't particularly care whether they remember me from time to time. If their instructions are the same every single time we meet, that's in my notes, right? They didn't remember that we'd had this conversation already, but their instructions are the exact same as the first time we met. And typically, honestly, in those circumstances, I do it three times. So to go back to the question about how do you make a living for that, you have to charge for that, right? In that case, you have to charge for it. But I think it serves everybody. It serves the client, it serves you, and it serves the beneficiaries. Everybody is better off if you are doing a proper assessment of capacity. Um, Judah, sorry, you wanted to ask something? No, I mean, I, I, I'm thrilled to hear how you take notes because uh, those details matter. And, you know, Rebecca and I have talked about this in the past about how somebody may have the best of intentions to do a will and they may reach out to a will lawyer. They may have an initial chat with somebody or they might even come into the, that first meeting and it may be six months down the road when they finally come back to execute the document with you or to meet you online because life is hectic, right? And so the best laid plans, uh, sometimes, you know, things take a turn. And so if you have those notes about a client and how they were presenting on one meeting, that helps you on your recall. This isn't just about litigation proofing your practice. Claims happen, that's why we have insurance, we're there for you. But it helps you because you're gonna be seeing dozens more clients right? If you're doing regular intake meetings, you may forget how they presented that day. But if you have noted, oh yeah, they came wearing a Habs jersey. It bothered me. We talked hockey. You know, they remembered that the Leafs haven't won a Stanley Cup since 67. You know, then, you know, there are certain things there. And that joke is a shout out to all my law pro Leaf fan colleagues, by the way. But, you know, if if you have those details and then the next time they come in and they're they're disheveled, uh, they are unengaged, they are, you know, there are changes, real changes, and then possibly changes to what am I even here for? Can you remind me? Who are you? Are you my banker? You know, those are real telltale signs. So sometimes we've got to remember that capacity is fluid. You know, we had a question come in. What do I do if a family member calls me and says, my my uh, my loved one is hospitalized, and we think we need a will. Okay, if you're in, if you have the ability to help people who are in hospital, even if they are potentially, sadly, on their deathbed, there is nothing wrong with doing that sort of work. It is very very meaningful and vital work, but you still need to check for capacity. There's no jumping through that stage just because somebody is in a dire situation, right? And we've, we actually have seen some people do Herculean efforts to try to get the wills prepared for people on their deathbeds, where sadly the will could not get signed before somebody passes away. And that will happen too, because of uh, we can't do this stuff instantly sometimes, right? 
And so unfortunately, it does take time to get this right. But you need to get it right for your own clients, not just for you, but for your clients. The last thing we want are people who have come to your office twice, and the first time they had an idea of things, and the second time they didn't, and maybe their intentions had changed, but no one can assess that at that point. And that's a sad reality, but uh, there are times where we can't continue to act, and we may have to deal with that. So before we move to the next uh, piece around undue influence, when you do see a shift in capacity, uh, that's a difficult discussion to have. And Pia, I'm wondering, you know, in your experience, what you've seen about how lawyers try to explain what needs to happen next, or if they cannot act, what the next steps might be. Yeah, I mean, I think a shift in capacity is one of those situations where it might be appropriate to request um, a capacity assessment, even if it is an invasive process, because, and usually that's because there's some time's elapsed. I think if the client's not willing to do it, then I think it's incumbent on you to maybe step back from your retainer and explain why, document why. Um, because ultimately it's, you know, it's your, it's not just, it's not just your practice that you're covering yourself for, it's your reputation as well. Um, and, you know, you also don't want to do something that could, you know, it would prejudice somebody to make a will when they're not, comp when they're not capable. That's why the legislation is the way it is. So again, yeah, do I mean, I, I also wanted to make a quick point about, I hope that answers the question too, Jeff, or so, but um, I wanted to make a quick note about documentation too. I can tell you that you know, many a will challenge. I'll, I'll have clients come in and I don't have a lot of information. I have what they're telling me. You know, grandma had no capacity. She was completely gone. There's no way she could have, you know, meant to do, she did not mean to do this. Um, I get the lawyer's file and a well-documented lawyer's file will lead to some difficult conversations with my clients who want to object to the will to say that actually, you know, based on everything I've seen here, um, this looks like there's not much of a case here. And that, you know, then it's dead in the water. You don't have to worry about your deductible. You don't have to worry about being cross-examined. And that's the other side of documentation is, is if you are examined in a, in a trial, a will challenge trial, you know, it's a lot better position to be in to say, well, I had three meetings instead of my normal one or two. Um, and I just, that's because I wanted to satisfy myself as to capacity. And, you know, that will do a lot more for the propounder of the will and, and you know, for, for you to be sort of comfortable with the fact that you did what you needed to do to, to discharge your duty. Thanks, Pia. I think that's a, a really uh, helpful way of, of framing it. So we're going to move on. Oh, Rebecca, go ahead. Can I just say one thing? As a drafter, um, when you get that call from someone in Pia's office saying they want your file, obviously it's a terrifying feeling. Um, and just a reminder, even though you naturally, or I will speak for myself, the first time I had to call LawPro saying someone wants my file, I was terrified to call LawPro, like really terrified. I felt like it meant I had done something wrong. There was something, you know, it doesn't. LawPro is on, and I don't work for LawPro. I'm a sole practitioner. LawPro is on our side, right? Like I felt like I was terrified to call. And then once I called, they said, can we have a copy of your file? I sent them my file. They were like, looks great. We don't see this going anywhere. And six weeks later, I got an email saying it's closed. Don't worry about it. That like, that is when you call LawPro, right? You never give Pia your file without calling LawPro and don't be terrified to call. I was the first time. Don't be terrified. Yeah, Chris lives and breathes these calls. There is something in the materials around managing the stress and anxiety about that, that report to law pro, because we know we, we've all, all of our claims counsel came from practice, came from situations where, uh, you know, that was also a worry. We get that. We've been in those shoes. Uh, Chris, did you want to add anything on this point? Yeah, no, that, that's a great, uh, that's a great point, Rebecca. Uh, so please, we're on your side. Uh, we're here to help. And look, mistakes happen. They happen to the best of us. And this is exactly why we have insurance. Um, so we're here for you. The only thing I wanted to add uh, to our discussion was, you know, these kinds of wills and estates claims, they often have a very long shelf life, right? So it's another reason why it's important to take good notes, because even if you're doing this assessment, like you may not remember this client in 10 10 plus years when they pass away and there's some or more when there and there's litigation about their estate uh you know there are many 
uh, many files that we get that are from many, many years ago. And the lawyer uh, at that point just may not remember this client, uh, but if you've got a well-documented file, you've got notes, that's going to jog your memory and that's going to help you. So it's, uh, it's, it's really critical for that reason too, because these rarely do these uh, happen, you know, where the mistake is made and, and it's, it, it comes to everyone's attention right away. It's usually not uh, until many, many years later. Yeah, fair, fair, excellent points all around. And remember, it doesn't cost to report a matter to LawPro. Uh, we are able to review many of these and close them without asking for any deductible or anything of the sort. Uh, that's what insurance is there for. Uh, we have a new claims unit uh, that will uh, eyeball these and uh, you know manage them through. And if things get heated, then you know we're there to to backstop. So uh, just remember, it does not cost. Uh, to report a claim, and you can report a claim directly at LawPro's website, lawpro.ca. So let's turn to another hot button area uh, that that is a, a really challenging piece, generally, where the challenges have been exacerbated through COVID. Um, and so, Pia, let, let's talk about undue influence, which you know, you must see all the time uh, those claims of undue influence or defending against them. Um, but why don't we start with the basics about what it is and and uh, what what we need to know for for today? Go ahead, Pia. Sure. And much like Rebecca, you know, for anything first principles, I go right back to my estates um, uh, summary from law school, and um, so I did that this you know when preparing for this as well. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the, the basics as a primer. I'll give some examples and then I'll talk about some practice tips. Um, so unlike capacity, a testator can actually have capacity and be unduly influenced. Um, sometimes, you know, they might be somebody with a bit more vulnerable, but typically um, in undue influence cases, you'll see that there, it's uh, somebody who would be otherwise considered capable. Um, undue influence is a pretty high uh, standard. So it's it's not it's it's somewhat difficult to prove, and I think anyone in litigation will tell you that you know many times you'll hear clients say, "No, my mom was influenced by my brother or whoever," and you know it's 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 uh, not quite that simple. Um, but what it is is essentially the will or the independence of the testator has to be overborne by another person. So it represents a degree of influence from some external source that dominates at the otherwise voluntary actions of the testator. So another way to think of it is that the will wouldn't have been made or these kinds of uh, gifts in the will wouldn't have been made, but for the influence or pressure exerted by somebody. Um, and that could involve threats, it can involve fraud, it can just involve pestering, it, it depends on the circumstances. Um, and that's another reason why this is such a, a difficult area to really um, talk about because it's so fact specific. Um, but at the end of the day, the result is that the will does not reflect the testator's true um, testamentary intentions. And um, it's important to note too that regular influence or just persuasion, um, you know, discussing tax advantages, those kinds of things, they don't necessarily and usually don't rise to the level of undue influence. It might be influence, but it's not necessarily undue. Um, so you may or may not remember from law school from the main case that sets out the test is about and Hay, and it's a Supreme Court decision from 1995. Um, and it's still a leading case. Um, <clears throat> and, and frankly, it's, you know, it does set out the test pretty in a straightforward way. Um, in that case, the, the testator had had made a will three years before he died, and he'd had a prior will, which benefited his siblings. And in his new will, he... Um, Gave, made his friend vote uh, the executor and she was the main beneficiary. I think he was 80 and she was 28. And it, and so that was one part of, you know, the suspicious circumstances and the fact that, you know, deviated so um, greatly from the prior will. So the court found that there were suspicious, suspicious circumstances. Um, you know, the, the instructions came from Bout over the phone to a secretary. Uh, she attended, she drove him to the lawyer's office and was in the meetings, both when he was instructing the lawyer on the will and when he signed it. And when he signed the will, he hesitated, but Vout assured him the will was what he wanted. Um, you know, her evidence was that she was only there because he needed a ride and he had asked for a referral to a lawyer and he appreciated her help with these kinds of things and that he was otherwise independent. Um, there's also evidence to show that, yes, he was independent. He was not an easily influenced person. 
and he was pretty strong-willed. And so even though all of those circumstances existed, the Supreme Court upheld the uh, lowest court decision that the will was valid. So even though um, you know the belt was sort of present in the meeting um, and all of those things that we are cautioning you very much against doing, um, that was still considered a, a valid will, um, given the fact that he had, he had capacity and, and he was independent-minded. So it's somewhat a hard thing to prove, um, but things to watch out for. So that's sort of the test, and it's something to look at from time to time, just to remind yourself um, of what the test is. Um, examples, though, of undue influence, you can see um, often with a vulnerable or elderly person who is potentially completely dependent on somebody, so either a spouse or an adult child, and that person, you know, can threaten to stop supporting them, will threaten to, you know, leave them on the street. Um, they'll often have, you know, exacerbated the vulnerability by isolating them from other people that are supportive. Um, and those are the kinds of situations where you will see um, claims that can be made out for undue influence. Um, and it's not just necessarily cases where the person influencing the testator is seeking to benefit. It might be that the person wants um, somebody else cut out of the will. And there's, there are cases, there's this, a very old Supreme Court case from 1907 that this, the testator was suffering from a mental illness, uh, sorry, terminal illness. And his brother kept telling him that the reason he was sick was because his wife was careless and she lacked skill in preparing food. And he really hammered this home to his brother. And as a result of the suggestions, um, he revoked his will that was in favor of his wife and made his brother the beneficiary instead. And the brother never suggested make me the beneficiary. He just said, it's your wife's fault, you're dying. Um, and the court found that the second will was invalid because he was so convinced by his brother that he was dying as a re direct result of his wife's um, behavior that he, he he changed his will and he wouldn't have done it otherwise. So those are some kind of some examples. Um, but things you can do, I mean, on top of the things we talked about, document, 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 um, ask a lot of questions, open-ended questions, ensure you understand you know, why does your client want to make a will or, or make a change to the will? And if they're making a big change to the will, it's really important that you're you're very satisfied that the changes um, that are being made are 100% are the decision of the testator, or at least, you know, maybe they saw an accountant, they got new advice, but there's a reason why. And there's a, there's, and it can, it could be an estrangement from a family member, but and as reluctant and as awkward as it is to ask clients those questions, you really do need to get into it. And I find that the clients, I've sat in in many meetings with my colleagues that prepare wills um, with, with clients that are elderly, partly just there to assess the risk and partly there to, to, um, to take notes and to assist. And, you know, they, they do respond to the fact that, listen, I'm asking questions. I know they're awkward, but... I want to make sure that when when we do your will, your will is going to be the last will and it's going to stand up. And they do tend to understand that there is risk, I think. So, you know, it's important to have those conversations. Um, again, make sure that the beneficiaries, the estate trustees, anybody that could potentially benefit from the will is not in the room when you're receiving instructions or when you're signing the will. Um, you know, and that can be awkward also. Um, and because the person might say, well, why don't you trust me? Or, or the, the testator might say, well, no, I want my spouse. I want my child in the room. And you can, you can say to them, listen, again, I'm just trying to protect you. That's my duty. I have a duty to you as your lawyer, um, and to no one else. So I need to make sure that this will is going to be seen as valid. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's really important that you, um, you are protecting yourself, but you're also protecting the client. Um, and to Judah's questions, my last point about um, reading, we're meeting remotely and with clients um, via Zoom. So there's a few things you can do. So, you know, when you first speak to the client, ensure, ask the client and ensure that there's a space that they can get some privacy when they're speaking to you uh, via video conference. Um, if it isn't possible, it might be the case that you might need to do an in-person meeting as inconvenient as that might be. Um, if there is a private space for the client, I think it's important during um, any significant meeting where you're getting instructions, giving advice, signing the will, have the client turn the computer or the camera around to ensure that there's no one else in the room. And, and just say that you're, you know, you don't have to tell the client that you don't trust them. You can just say, I want to document it in my notes and do document it in your notes, of course. Um, and, you know, if you can, you can, there are some tells, you can see if someone's looking to the side or looking, you know, 
be very observant and make notes um, of your client's behavior during the call. Um, and it, you know, it's fine if someone needs to help them to set up the computer, but there's no reason really for them to be there during the meeting and the substance of the meeting. And frankly, even as a litigator, just to protect privilege, I do the same thing. I ask my clients to ensure that they are somewhere private where no one else is you know, listening in um, because I wanna make sure that I'm not inadvertently um, gonna potentially um, give an argument to another side regarding privilege. So those are my main points about, about undue influence. Well, thanks, Pia. And, you know, these take some really interesting twists and turns, and unfortunately, we don't have time for all of them. But we've seen ones where somebody's saying, hey, I don't want to pay for an interpreter, I want to use a family member. And that's a red flag if that family member is a potential beneficiary. And that's a really hard conversation to have, uh, especially if it may impact on costs. Of course, if you don't speak the language of your client, but you know Will's lawyers who do, that's another opportunity to potentially refer to somebody who has that additional linguistic capacity uh, who can you know, advise somebody without somebody else in the room. So that's one tricky area we see uh, from time to time. Of course, there's just the general support of wanting a loved one in the room, but sooner or later, you're going to need to assess that client as an individual. And if you can't do that, that is a red flag. I'd mention one other area also for undue influence. And, and again, this is not to say that in most cases, people are mean-spirited or trying to fleece you. These are just humans trying to help each other. And the lawyer-client relationship is a real shift from how people lead their everyday lives. You usually do have a support worker with you or a family member with you for difficult things. But personal support workers and caregivers are another tricky area. We've seen people call in to say, I don't know what to do. This person says they have no family, that they have outlived everyone in their family, and they are going to want to leave the house to the caregiver or something like that. And that is quite possibly very well-intentioned and possibly their wishes. But how to get from there to making sure that there is no undue influence can at times be relatively simple, at times it can be a bit trickier. And that is an assessment that combines both capacity assessments at times and undue influence. So all of this gets tricky and those open-ended questions and uh, those uh, notes that you're gonna take along the way are going to help you for sure. So, you know, here again, we're blowing up on the chat function and it is wonderful uh, to feel this connection that we don't even necessarily see in person because people may be reluctant to put their hands up. Thank you, continue the Q and A's because even if we don't get to yours today, these are gonna feed into how we can further provide content down the road, but we're gonna move to another topic. And this is one that uh, you know, you're know you not gonna necessarily think of every day, but quickly, I wanna do an overview of some of the fraud risks we are seeing because lawyers and law firms are targeted by fraudsters, including at times by organized crime, in order to try to get money out of your trust accounts, or because you're a small business to otherwise simply take you for a ride and run with funds. So these are sometimes generic and sometimes targeted frauds, but I just want to walk through a few that we're seeing so that you're on alert. The first is a, a lower risk one, is that we have seen some law firm lawyer impersonation schemes. These come in fairly frequently. We get a few calls a month on those, and those are just on the ones on people who bother to call us. These are places where they've taken your goodwill and they've either mimicked your name or mimicked your firm or copied and pasted from your website. And some fraudster has created a fake site out there. And they then are faxing or emailing or writing to others saying, hey, I'm the estate's lawyer, write me because you have come into some money. And I just need a quick upfront retainer to get this through Ontario's probate system. We usually see this, for example, with faxes going out to people in the United States or in other close countries where somebody's gonna try to then pay a retainer on the uh, assumption that they're gonna see a six or seven figure windfall from some long lost deceased relative who you act for. And so in trying to verify whether this is a scam or not, people sometimes take good looking lawyer websites and impersonate them. Thankfully, we haven't really seen claims arise out of this, 
it's more of a nuisance and usually the fraudster will move on to others over time. But I want you to be aware of this because we have seen some wills and estates firms expressly mimicked. And if it happens to you, just give us a call and we'll give you an article of the things that you can do to ask that a website be taken down, to advise the police, to let the law society know that they may get some complaints from other jurisdictions where somebody may have sent a retainer only to see that money run. So that's that's a low lying issue, but it does hurt us because it's your goodwill and it's your Google searchability and all of the rest of it that, that comes in. The real risk right now though are cyber dangers and bad check schemes where people are either, when we talk about cyber, uh, we're seeing cyber attacks and breaches of law firms. And it, it, it can be you as a solo or you as a big firm, you're all being targeted right now. And the concern is this, somebody may try to infiltrate your system or pretend to be an outsider who you have been having dealings with in order to find a moment where money is supposed to go from one account to another and they're gonna ask you to divert those funds. Never send payments without doing an independent verification. So if Pia is supposed to send money to Rebecca, I don't care how many times the two of them have exchanged money, client monies before, if Pia's emailed a wire notice to Rebecca, and if Rebecca is doing wire payments, but it would be the same for checks, call Pia back on a number you already had for Pia. Not the number in that email, because if Pia's email was breached, a sophisticated hacker would then change her number on the email to whatever her, his or her or their burner phone is, okay? So go independently find that phone number. Go Google for Pia's firm, find her profile, make sure they match up and call her to confirm before you send the payment. This stuff gets really sophisticated, but we ran a, a symposium on this in December and it's available at practicepro.ca slash CPD because we can't get into all of it right now. It covered a full hour and a half, but I can tell you on the week that we ran that program, a law firm was being targeted and they let their entire team watch the event and the admin support staff were able to catch a 480,000 and change wire fraud that was in progress because they watched that event. Okay, so have a look because the other piece of that event will teach you about is the limits of coverage because you do have some available coverage through LawPro, but depending on the nature of the breach, if it's a straight up ransomware attack where somebody hacks you and then asks for ransomware, there may not be coverage through LawPro. You may need other insurance to protect you. So go have a look at our CPD about cyber dangers. Uh, that's from December of last year. It is still extremely current. Pia, I know you're in a, a larger firm setting. Are there a couple of takeaways that you would add? Yeah, um, for sure. I think that, um, you know, and this is, so at my firm, we do quarterly for the staff and for the lawyers, um, training on sort of issues like spam, phishing, ransomware attacks, and best practices for security for your phone, for your computer, for just hygiene as far as um, technology goes. And I can even say from experience at a smaller firm, I think the importance of staff training, because I think a lot of stuff does get delegated down. Um, a lot of types of emails that lawyers might kind of be a bit more suspicious of, a staff might innocently open. I know of a case where, um, you know, a, a, a an assist, an office manager of a law firm had an email that she thought was from a vendor that, you know, was a, a fake vendor and opened it, it opened a link to a fake invoice and then a ransomware attack ensued. So it's really important that everybody gets um, the training. So you might get new staff and there's turnover, but just make sure everybody's sort of up to date and make sure you're keeping, you know, your firm as a whole. I know regardless of size, um, up to date, there are resources, as Judah was saying, you know, on the Law Pro website, you don't have to pay a third party to, to get that kind of um, training or information. Oh, thanks, Pia. I mean, for sure, start with us and start with the free resources. And then depending on where you're at, and depending on what kind of IT support you have, you're going to want to think about what else you might need to do. If you're at a larger firm or a firm with multiple uh, accounts, you may consider, for example, just penetration testing, uh, where somebody's going to send out emails and see if you click on them, 
and basically give you a benchmark on how you're doing for spotting the phishing frauds, spotting those things. It's just like those calls you're getting on your cell phones daily from CRA or from the fraud department that tells you that your credit card has been compromised or whatever. These are being sent out there because they do land eventually. And so the key is that it's not you, but know that as a lawyer in a professional services area where you operate with your own money and trust accounts, you're being targeted. I can, I can assure you that lawyers are being targeted. So stay on alert, stay vigilant, call before you click and wire any money, call before you send any checks out, make sure you keep your checks in your trust account until they are cleared by a bank before you send out any money. And just be careful out there, check out our resources for more. So now we're gonna just change over uh, to some of our practice management tips for the next normal. And, and the bottom line is we, we all did that, that practice pivot due to the pandemic. And we know we're not going back from there, but we are gonna keep going forward. You know, we're gonna have, we're gonna normalize certain processes that were sort of trial and error through the pandemic. But as we get to whatever our next state is, we're all gonna be looking at what do we need to do next? You know, we all made our makeshift home offices for a time. And then we're gonna reinvest and say, okay, what can I do now to get really comfortable? Because apparently this is my, my office or I'm going back to the office and I've got a computer from 2020 or before. It's a time for new hardware. There's lots to be considering. In terms of your technology, Practice Pro has a technology page at practicepro.ca slash technology. And you can actually check out, there are some resource materials, uh, including charts of legal technologies that are, uh, are available. And there are even some examples of technologies in those charts that are specific and laid out as being specific to wills and estates lawyer. Things like uh, eState Planner, for example. I know one of the questions came in, what do you think of those tools? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's a balance for how you provide your service and at what price point. But some of these tools like eState Planner provide incredible visualization tools, which can help you communicate effectively with a client where you can show them their family tree. You can show them what your understanding of their assets are. You can confirm things very easily. And then it also has sort of decision tree logic that will help you make sure that you're covering the key bases. So have a look at the different technologies that are out there because some of them are gonna make your practice easier at the end of the day. Uh, I just thought we'd go around the table to ask you know, the different panelists, what are some of the tips and tricks that they've adopted uh, since 2020? What are some of the things in terms of practice management or tech uh, that they would uh, note have been helpful to them. So why don't I start with Rebecca? Thanks. So um, I'm a sole practitioner and um, I have run a paperless office since I went out on my own eight years ago. So I have used Clio, which I think is phenomenal software as a practice manager. I was from a big firm, so that's how I was trained, right? That or in size firm, but um, you know, every file is opened, every file has a number, you need a practice management software um, for me. So I've had one from the beginning, but what I've changed during the pandemic, well, Clio, the software has changed that you can now, so I used to send out asset forms to clients and they would email them back to me and then they would bring any doc backup documentation to the meeting and I would scan it if I need it. But Clio now can allow you to do all of that in their website, which has, bank level security for whatever that means. It's comforting for clients. Listen, my retainer certainly says we're all taking a risk with everything we do online, um, but Clio has security. They can upload their assets directly to like the asset list. My form is now directly in Clio and clients are given a link instead of asked to fill out a form. And I'm finding even elderly clients find it easier. They've all spent enough time now online over the last two years. Um, or again, I don't care if someone else does it for them, so long as I'm confirming it with them, but they can upload all of their assets directly to Clio and they can upload any backup documentation directly to Clio. Um, and then, you know, for lots of clients don't feel secure sending things back and forth by email. That's a much easier thing that I've adopted during COVID. Um, 
And then I haven't, I don't do virtual signings throughout all of COVID and continuing now. I still do signings in person. I want, I did them outdoors for a year and a half and now I'm back in the office. But, um, and if clients are really uncomfortable, then I'm still meeting them outdoors. But I still want at some moment in the will planning retainer, I want a moment where I'm in person with the client face to face, knowing that there's no one else around us. And if that's the first time I've ever had it, I'm confirming their instructions again at the signing meeting. So um, I want it in person for that. But um, certainly the software Clio is this. I don't work for Clio, but it's great. First and, of all, and, there are, and there are lots of different options, but that is sure. an, an example, a perfect use case of how the client onboarding uh, using technology can become easier uh, for everyone. So if you're putting yourself in the shoes of your client, it's fewer touch points to get further along, uh, which is always welcome. And then for you, it's fewer touch points and headache points to try to get all that information at different points. Uh, it helps you be better prepared and off you go. Uh, Pia, are there particular things? Uh, I know you're in litigation and I know that there are some uh, hiccups around uh, court filings and use of case lines. And there, there are a lot of things that people are needing to learn right now. Uh, but what are some things that are working well that you wanted to share with people? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of DocuSign now um, for affidavits. I still have to meet with my client on Zoom and, and um, but, you know, that's one of those technologies. I, I think one of the things that I changed up, I think, whereas I used to really rely on, on support staff before, I think I've taken the time to kind of really familiarize myself with the technology because, I think a lot of we've all had to become a bit more independent during the pandemic. So, you know, and to the extent that there's, um, you know, there's free training out there. The OBA has some really good training. I know I did my firm did training for case lines, but I also did the OBA training just I felt I needed some more um, depth to it and not no criticism on either end. I learned different things from both programs, but, you know, just keep, keep making sure you're staying up to date. I think that's the hardest thing. The other, the other thing, actually, the pandemic, ironically, is I'm I'm much more likely to pick up the phone these days. I think everyone's a bit overwhelmed with email, and frankly, something that could be that would be eight emails could be a three minute conversation. And I think sometimes we forget that um, just by, by a matter of habit is to shoot an email off. But you know, if you it's it's just as a practice uh, point. I think sometimes we need to remember to use the phone a bit more often. <laughs> Yeah, Pia, that's a, that's a great point about the phone. I'll put in the chat function that we actually have an article for those of you who are not comfortable using the phone because we aren't all comfortable using phone. It takes a reminder, but we actually have an article to help you with that. Chris, what about you? Tech success 101, what's been working for you? Yeah, well, listen, technology is great. Uh, I love it. And it definitely makes uh, makes our lives easier and lets us be more efficient. Often I do wonder, like I haven't seen any claims yet um, related to virtual signings. But of course, uh, sometimes uh, these things have a, have a long fuse and it may not be years until we see anything. But yeah, I, I wonder that myself too, like about some of the challenges of you know, if, if you're meeting with a client virtually, you don't necessarily control, you don't control the space. Um, uh, somebody else might be helping them uh, get set up with the technology. Uh, so I think it's just important that you, you know, you ask all the questions about, is there anyone else present? Um, you know, I'll go through all those things. Who else is in the house? Um, and, and of course, you know, take notes uh, with respect to those question, questions being asked. Um, uh, just to sort of try to uh, mitigate the the risks associated with that. I personally, I think my preference would have been to also meet with the person uh, in person, but uh, you know, I appreciate that it's not always possible. Um, so you just want to, I guess, be aware of, of some of those challenges. And you know, you don't have to dive into all of these different tech tech uh, solutions that we've been talking about. Clearly. Uh, I think what uh, Chris, Rebecca, and Pia are all saying is that there's a bit of a balance uh, that everyone's going to find in their own comfort levels in terms of what process is going to work that's going to make them feel uh, confident and able to adequately uh, support their clients through their journey uh, with the ability to screen for the important information uh, you're going to need, both in terms of uh, documentation, but also screening out uh, for, for capacity issues and for undue influence issues. 
if you're still sort of on the fence on some of these tech, you know, test it out, take a flyer uh, on the uh, chart that we've provided uh, with various links to different tech providers. Uh, we don't endorse any of them necessarily, uh, but we wanted you to be aware of the type of technology that's emerged uh, recently and, and not so recently, but we've hyperlinked to trainings, uh, to little demos and other areas. And so you can get a feel for them. And uh, you know you should feel free to talk to your colleagues about what's been working for them. Uh, and then think about what's gonna work for you. Bring in your team as well, if you're not a true solo, because uh, everyone's gonna have to be on the same page around these things. Pia was absolutely right in saying, hey, you, know, you can't just delegate away the tech, you're all gonna be in this together. And we've all been in this event together. So I wanna thank you all. I think we're coming to a natural closing point and it breaks my heart because I see 30 more things to address in the Q&A and we haven't been able to get to all of them. I'm seeing things in the chat function that's been buzzing all the way through this. Lovely to see such an engaged group with us today. And if you're on the replay, thank you uh, for being a part of this uh, sort of in, in the not so distant future. Uh, I just wanted to get through a few thank yous and housekeeping notes at some of which have already come in on the Q&A uh, in terms of the CPD. If you want to claim this program as CPD, you can do so over at your Law Society portal. This is eligible for 1.5 hours of professionalism credit. It's also eligible for Law Pro's risk management credit, and you can claim that at lawpro.ca. As I mentioned, the program is going to be a replay on practicepro.ca CPD webpage. If you want to know when that happens, you can subscribe to our blog at avoidacclaim.com. And when this goes live as a replay on YouTube and on, on our practicepro.ca site, uh, we will send out an update from our blog. And so if you subscribe there, you'll get notified. And then you can share this with your staff or share this with your colleagues or rewatch it if you wish. A few thank yous. Uh, first, thank you, uh, Rebecca, Pia, Chris. Uh, this has been a fantastic. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Uh, and your candor, uh, even if it ruffled some of your colleagues' feathers today, uh, I think that that uh, brutal honesty about uh, the things that we need to be doing these days uh, and the challenges and opportunities, it's, it's worth having these sorts of discussions. Thank you for be being so game today and sharing all of your expertise. But the Toronto Lawyers Association is also game always, and they've been making, uh, they're making a donation on your behalf, actually, to Lawyers Feed the Hungry as a thank you for your participation. Uh, the Toronto Lawyers Association is a, a fantastic partner for Law Pro. We are so thrilled to have been able to develop the series with them. Uh, thank you to their executive director, Joan Rattake Lang, to Deirdre Harrington, uh, to the entire TLA team. We thank you as always. Uh, thanks to Ontario's law associations. They take uh, the info as shared from uh, their colleagues in Toronto and have shared this across the province. And so we know some of you are coming in from outside the 416 and we appreciate all of the law associations who have promoted the event and thank all of you for uh, joining us today. Of course, thanks to the entire team at LawPro for everything they do, including our speaker, Chris and uh, Sean Erker in particular for helping with uh, some of today's materials. Okay, so here's the next piece. Uh, for everyone who's here today, you're gonna receive an email from the TLA for the program evaluation. Really, please complete it. It really helps both Toronto Lawyers Association and LawPro develop future programming. And of course, if you have other comments about today or things you wanna share, or if it's tweaked a question, feel free to give us a shout. Our general email is practicepro at lawpro.ca. That concludes our program for today. Again, thank you so much for being a part of it. I'd invite you all to check out the resources, read that fact sheet, read the Landmines for Lawyers articles, check out our articles about what to do next and our, the Law Society link that we've provided for help if you're trying to locate a will or a document, uh, they've got resources to help you figure out uh, that path. And then, of course, uh, if you've got further questions or concerns, reach out again to Practice Pro. That concludes today's program. Thank you so much for being a part of it today. All the best today. Bye.